evening, everybody. I'm Lee Hammond, a member of the uh, Lebanon Historical Society Executive Board, I guess. Uh, there aren't a lot of members of the Historical Society, and I hope maybe you'll be inspired after tonight to wish to join our ranks. Uh, if you want to know how to do that, you can uh, go online and go to the Lebanon Historical Society. How many of you have access to access this via the line? Yes? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. I always get confused when I try to get on. And uh, I realize I've got to say Lebanon, New Hampshire some of the time where there's a Lebanon, Ohio, and so on and so forth. I'd like to introduce Michelle Sherburn, who has brought all these wonderful artifacts. When she said she was bringing artifacts, I was scared. I thought uh, I had all kinds of terrible visions in my mind. But I have a weird mind. If you saw my poster, you saw the first thing that hit me was the Canadian border in 19, uh, 2017 and what's been going on recently across the Canadian border and how one has to tiptoe across the ground in various entrepreneurs. So, Maybe it wasn't quite that devious. I will find out. Anyhow, thank you uh, for coming, Michelle, all the way down from Newbury, is it? From Vermont, by the side of the river, and uh, sharing her research, which is great. And if you're excited enough and have great means, she's got some books over there afterwards that you maybe twist her arm. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and I'm very excited to share uh, the, the work that I've been doing. Uh, just, to, just to give you an idea um, of where, where this came from, uh, 20, 25 years ago, uh, I was given a newspaper article assignment. Uh, I worked for a daily newspaper in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. And I was told, can you do a feature piece on uh, a house in Haverhill, New Hampshire? It was supposedly an Underground Railroad safe house for runaway slaves. I'd never heard that, and I didn't know much about it. I just knew the, you know, the basics of the Underground Railroad. So I went and um, did an interview with the owner of the house and learned a little bit about the Underground Railroad from her. And then I started to look into it. And I got hooked. I, honestly, I got hooked. And um, that, was, that was in 1992. And I haven't gotten off the subject. It, it, I'm still there. And the house actually um, it is in Haverhill Corner. It's the Bliss Tavern. And this was the house that started it all. And um, what, I, what took me a very long time was I started in Vermont because I live in Vermont. I'm a Vermont historian. And so, um, oh, Barbara, I'm sorry, I told you I wouldn't move. Is it better over there? OK. Um, so I started in Vermont researching. But 25 years ago, this subject was not taken seriously. I kept running into walls because even state historians, even um, academics, uh, all were telling me the same thing. It's just a bunch of legends and folklore, and that when, when slaves were running away, they were safe once they got to New England. There's no reason for them to hide or to be, you know, skirted off anywhere. They were fine here. And I kept learning about different it, events and people and realizing that well, they weren't fine here and it, it was not a safe place. So that's where I got, I started, was in Vermont. And I also, um, because Vermont was known as the anti-slavery state in the 1800s, it was the first state to abolish slavery in the country, um, I kept coming up with conflicting, conflicting attitudes. And those attitudes actually if I zoom out for you, the, the attitudes and misconceptions about the Underground Railroad have been rampant for the past 150 years. So I'm going to educate you a little bit, um, enlighten, and also 
explain that uh, why the Underground Railroad was such a big deal and why it was so risky. So when you zoom out and you look at the picture in the 1800s, um, we, keep, we, we have this um, misconception that Northerners, everybody in the North, in the 1800s before the Civil War, that they were against slavery, that they wanted freedom for all the slaves, and they wanted to have, they wanted equality for blacks. And yes, you had free blacks, and you had uh, fugitive slaves living free in the North. But this misconception of the fact that we want, that all Northerners felt this way, uh, that's not what I found. I read a lot, and I didn't just stay in Vermont, and I didn't just stay in New Hampshire. When I research, I have to re I have to encompass the entire subject. So uh, the Underground Railroad, the abolitionist movement, I'm reading every source that I can get my hands on, from <coughs> Indiana, Ohio, all Pennsylvania, New York, all the way to the Canadian border. Now, what I found in every single northern state, especially in New England, was the NIMBY, the NIMBY. It's okay if slavery's in the South, it's not in my backyard, I don't care. This is the attitude before the Civil War, um, that it's okay that they have slavery, it doesn't touch us. So a lot of New Englanders were very complacent. And it, it, since it didn't really, they didn't see it, they didn't really have an idea of what slavery really was, they just, we just don't want to deal with it. And what I found in, in all northern states, and Vermont and New Hampshire, was that the prejudice against blacks at this time frame was terrible. And the persecution that they, they faced was, it was awful. Um, you could, you had no, um, no real justice for free blacks. You could just tick off one white person and they could accuse you of being a runaway slave, and you could be sold, sent back into slavery, even though you weren't a slave. Classic example, 12 years a slave, the, the story of Solomon Northup. Real story, real person. I met him, well, not directly, but um, I found his autobiography on a shelf in the Northeast Kingdom in a library 25 years ago. I read that and just was aghast that he was in Saratoga Springs, New York, he was kidnapped and he was sold into slavery and had it took 12 years to fight the red tape and get him out of slavery and he was a free man. So how safe is that? And also, by the way, I have to keep going across the river, so please forgive me, but um, Solomon Northup had ties with uh, some of my Vermont agents. In Heartland, Vermont, uh, there was a Lane, Jane, Lane John Smith who was a minister in Heartland. And he was helping runaway slaves. And guess who was helping him? Solomon Northam. The, he was actually, he did speaking engagements throughout New Hampshire and Vermont after he got back and after he wrote his book. So I have ties, local ties with Northam. Uh, the other thing, we talked about the complacency. Now, the whole point of getting the subject of the Underground Railroad, no matter what state you're in, in New England, is you have to understand why it was dangerous and why there was, um, why there was risk. And part of that was because even if, you, um, even if you just talked against slavery, you were considered some kind of fanatic, okay? If you, if you stood up at town meeting and said, okay, I want to just go on record saying that all of the slaves in the South should be free, I think we need to abolish slavery. If you did that in the 1800s in New Hampshire at Lebanon's town meeting, you would be told to shut up, sit down, we don't want to hear it. And the abolitionists, who were the people who were really fighting for the cause, really going out there and, and risking the, themselves to say, we want to change the government. We don't adhere to the Constitution. We do not, we will not hold office. We will not pledge allegiance to the flag as long as you have slavery in this country. That made you a fanatic, a radical, a traitor. This is a poster that was in 1837. A poster in a town in New England that said an abolitionist was coming to talk 
and they wanted people to come out to put down and silence this tool of evil and fanaticism. So if you just talked about it, okay, this is, this is the reception they, that they got. And I found in researching New Hampshire that abolitionists and this lecture circuit that traveled around New England, all the big names, William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass, um, I don't, yeah, oh, here we go, you can see them. Um, Stephen Simons Foster, uh, George Thompson came over from uh, England because he was a, a huge uh, abolitionist and he was brought over by Garrison, asked over by Garrison to stir things up. Um, sorry. The abolitionists actually targeted New Hampshire because in the 1830s and 40s, New Hampshire was really growing fast. And they targeted New Hampshire and this guy here, Parker Pillsbury, native of Hennepin, New Hampshire, was a very outspoken abolitionist and he wrote a book called The Acts of the Apostles. And, he, and it, in it, he talks about the mission field of New Hampshire and how we need, to, we need to educate the people here about slavery and how awful it is. And they really targeted New Hampshire. And this whole book tells about going into a town and say, going to the minister and, having, and saying, we want to have a lecture at the, you know, the Kilton Library on Thursday night. Is that OK? And the minister going, you're not allowed here. Don't, we don't want you talking here because they were talking about shaking up the country. They were talking about getting the South splitting. Oh wait, didn't they? <laughs> didn't the South, <laughs> they seceded. Well, this is what they were afraid of. That's why they didn't want to hear about it. So all of this sets my stage. We're getting a very negative tone. If you, have, if you are against slavery, keep it to yourself. If you are truly against it. If you want to help someone who's trying to get away from slavery, if that's illegal. So that, that sets a tone that you are risking your reputation because it really mattered. It really mattered in town if, if people thought that you were a crazy fanatic. They're not going to, um, they're not going to pay, patronize your business. They're not going to talk to you and your family or your children. They're going to shun you. You're going to lose your business connections, your social connections. It really mattered what people thought because everything was so small back then. Now, New Hampshire really kind of threw me, honestly. Um, I'm going to share about the Underground Railroad. Um, I have lots of photos here. But the thing about Vermont, I, I'm a Flatlander, okay? I'm from Pennsylvania, I came up here when I was a kid, but I'm still a Flatlander. And I know in Vermont, Vermonters just don't welcome you so easily. They don't share or talk to you about things. They just don't talk about them, okay? I live in a town where um, a group of guys murdered one of the guys in town and Everybody knew about it, and nobody would talk about it. And nobody got caught for it, nobody got prosecuted, and that secret is 60 years old, and still nobody will talk about it. Okay? You just don't talk about it. And even when I researched the uh, Underground Railroad in Vermont, I came across people, even like, you know, last year, who were like, um, we know some stuff about runaways, but, you know, we just don't go there. I'm not going to talk about what great grandpa did. And that's like, what? <laughs> it's 2016 and you're still keeping secrets? Okay. But speaking of secrets, when I started researching more in New Hampshire to uncover more about um, Underground Railroad, um, safe houses and agents, talk about um, the abolitionist movement, I'm finding out that in New Hampshire, you had historians who just decided to rewrite history. They decided to eliminate things. And they, they literally erased certain parts of New Hampshire history. And I'm not the one that dug all this up. Boy, well, it would have been great, but I'm not the one. I found out that, the, that in the late 1890s, when all of the New England towns were doing, writing their town histories, you look at the dates, 1890, 1888, when you had local historians writing their histories, they didn't want to focus on anything negative. 
we're restructuring our country. We don't want to focus on the bad of the Civil War. We're going to focus on war heroes. We're not going to talk about the bad South and how awful they were for having slavery. We're just, and we're not going to talk about blacks in our town. And literally, in the 1890s, they just, they, the historians wrote out a very large portion of New Hampshire history. To the point where New Hampshire, even in the 1900s, was known as the Lily White State. Because they had no, we had no blacks in New Hampshire. This is true. But it was because historians back then were irresponsible and they wanted to make everything all nice and charming. And aren't we the good guys and aren't we wonderful? So I found out that there was a slave trade, that there was slavery in almost every, there were slave owners in almost every town in New Hampshire, um, that there's a whole heritage of blacks in New Hampshire. Um, and of course the Underground Railroad existed. So let's find out about that. I'm not the one that uncovered this, but up until the 19, <coughs> when it really went public, 1990s, Portsmouth, New Hampshire's history was about ships, the shipping industry, and about the architecture, and how New Hampshire was founded there in Portsmouth um, on the coast. It wasn't until an incredible black historian Valerie Cunningham was going through church records and she found a name and that name opened up an entire world that we didn't know existed. And that name was Venus. And she was a black woman who was in the church records in Portsmouth for the church um, giving her money. Just a little bit. Now, she started digging. She found over 400 ads in the New Hampshire Gazette in Portsmouth for the sale of slaves. She went through records and she found that um, in 1765, there were over 650 slaves owned in Portsmouth alone. So Valerie is, Cunningham is the one. She wrote Black Portsmouth, and you have got to read that. It is incredible what she has uncovered. And the Black Ports, uh, the Portsmouth, Black Heritage Trail exists today, where you can go to different um, sites in, in the city and find out where you have the North Church that's on record for having slave pews because the owners in town bought se pew sections for their slaves to come to church. Or that if you go to Strawberry Bank, you can visit my name, my husband's name, say the Sherburn House on Strawberry Bank, and the, um, the Studley's Tavern and the William Pitt Tavern, those, that, those were taverns where slave sales were held because of this history. This history that slavery was happening in New Hampshire. Now, I don't know if you knew that, and I'm sorry if I'm shocking people, but this is, this is what has been covered. The ships in Portsmouth were uh, worldwide known as the best ships. They were they were built sleek. They were schooners. They were not slave. They were not big slavers. They were sleek, and th that is an image of this. This is the nightingale, similar to that. They the the white pine was in, uh, exported out of New Hampshire. All of the woods were being you know they were clearing them, and they were shipping the white pine overseas to England, um, all around the country because of the quality of the wood. And in Portsmouth, they were building these ships. Now, you have in Portsmouth, these ships are leaving to go get, they're, they're going to stock up, they're going to go get all the, uh, the, um, uh, the imports. They go to Africa. So they're going to Africa. And the, the businessmen in Portsmouth were financing the, the voyages. And these voyages would go to Africa, and they would stop at all of these places. These are the old, the 1800, the, sorry, the 1600, 1700 names, okay? All of these, and they would get all of these imports, but they also would buy slaves. So one ship might have 200 slaves that are bought. The Portsmouth 
businessmen were financing those, ship, those um, voyages. Those slaves were taken across, they were part of the transatlantic slave, slave trade, and they would be sold in the Caribbean and in the South, maybe Boston, maybe Providence, and then they would come to Portsmouth and maybe have 20 left, and they would sell them. I don't know if I have ads. Um, they would sell them there. So this was happening on a regular basis from the 1600s and the 1700s, a regular stream of um, shipments coming in and part of the cargo were these slaves. That's amazing to me. And um, there was a student, Eric Luritsen, who did a, a thesis at Dartmouth College on the New Hampshire slave trade. And he, he went through and researched detailed research of the manifests so that he knew so he knew who was the captain, how where they stopped, what they picked up for cargo, where they um, where they offloaded the slaves and what they brought back to Portsmouth. This is amazing stuff. This is amazing history. Now those slaves were obviously unwilling immigrants. They were they were stolen and they were brought here. Now in New Hampshire, you had, um, you didn't have the same slavery that the South had, obviously. So in Portsmouth, when you had 650 plus slaves in the city, what were they doing? Well, you might have, well, no, I know for a fact, you had two, uh, a man and a wife in the Sherburne house, two slaves there, um, in, um, in the Moffat Ladd house. This is the home of the Declaration of Independence sire, William Whipple. He had slaves here. He may have had like six of them. These, these houses, these places in Portsmouth, and you have one or two. Maybe they were house servants. Maybe they helped if, you, if you, your owner was a carpenter. Maybe you helped out in the shop. Shipbuilding, obviously you're gonna work the docks, et cetera. Now, I did learn that in the 1790 census, if you look through all of the towns in New Hampshire, there's, there were slave owners in, in towns from um, Exeter all the way up to Pittsburgh and the Canadian border. Tiny, I mean, maybe one or two. In Piermont, New Hampshire, which is right across the river from where I work in Bradford, Vermont. Piermont, New Hampshire, you know, you're going to miss it if you don't watch it because it just has a store, it has a school, and a flashing light, and you, it's gone. I mean, you're, 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 you're out of Piermont. But I know for a fact that there were slave owners there. And I know that there was a slave, Thomas Waterman, who was brought there as a child. And when he was 18, he was given his freedom, and he was given property on the Robert Evans farm. So I have, um, I have a copy of the lease for Thomas Waterman because he actually got his freedom. I have the, the lease of the property. He was given a house and property, and he worked on the farm still. I have um, his death certificate, and I have I know where he's buried. He was a slave in all these little towns, or uh, you know, Orford and um, in Lebanon. All these towns had a smattering, okay, which is an amazing thing, but a sad thing. If you're the only, if there's one slave in a town, how horrible an existence that is, okay? Because they were not. They were not as those, some of those New Hampshire old histories want to, that did mention about slaves. If you read uh, Nathan Wooten's um, History of Concord, New Hampshire, he has little cute anecdotes about slaves. Yes, we had some slaves, but you know, they were, they, it was nothing like the South. Really, you read it, okay, I'm paraphrasing, but <laughs> it's like this. Um, it, it was not horrible. These slaves were like part of our family. They were like cousins, they were like children. They were one of us. No, they weren't, <laughs> okay? No, they weren't. They were part of maybe your cattle because that is how they, that is how they were treated. I don't care if you lived in the house. The Sherbert's, the man and the woman that lived in that house, they weren't even, their names aren't even on the, um, on the inventory or on the will. They're just named as male and female slaves. And I know that they didn't even have a room. They slept in the L, in the attic, a little space. Okay, so this is the this is the sense I'm getting. Okay, when I'm reading about 
different lives. So that's some a history that has been buried. But the thing about history is that it's going to surface whether you like it or not. So the same with the Underground Railroad. You're going to have this kind of history surface, just like slaves, just like having a black heritage. Now we know that there were, there's a rich black heritage because there were blacks who did end up getting their freedom. Now I do need to go on record. Um, from the 1600s to the early 1800s, we had um, slavery in New Hampshire. New Hampshire never abolished it, but it became out of fashion because you could, if you needed workers, instead of buying people, you could hire um, immigrants because at the, in the 1700s, all of a sudden, we're getting, what are we getting? We're getting Germans coming in and the, uh, the, the Irish and that you have poor white immigrants coming in and they're the ones that are getting all the jobs. And so blacks who, so after a while, it was like, okay, now it kind of died out. So by the early 1800s, you don't really hear much about slaves. And technically, New Hampshire never eliminated um, slavery. Never. Not until President Lincoln did it with the, um, the 13th Amendment. So even though some people think that 1857 and there was a law that changed it, that's not true. Um, so let's go into um, the Underground Railroad. Now this is this is the subject that's so difficult because so many people so in the 1970s a lot of historians really wanted to downplay this. Um, the theory was that um, white Americans wanted to come off as the good guys. So they painted themselves off as the heroes of the story. Now in reality, the slaves were the heroes of the story. They are the ones who actually had the courage to run away because they knew what the price would be. And it's, you know, if you read slave accounts, if you, you know, if even some of the movies now are very graphic, this is the price they would pay was horrific. They're the ones who were the heroes. But they needed help, especially since most of them had probably never been out of the county that they, they were born and raised in. And it gets even worse. If you're going to get up further into New England, they don't even know what this kind of weather is like. I mean, they, this is all uncharted territory. So once you got up into New England here, they needed help, just like they did in Pennsylvania. Um, and, and the Underground Railroad was a network of people who would help people. And you had it in every northern state, no matter what the historians say. Um, every state had people helping. There was a lot, uh, right down here, down the spot in fine here of New York, the New York border in Vermont, mm -hmm. you had, you could go past a runaway from um, Philadelphia to Jersey and up the border of New York, be, uh, staying in a Quaker home all the way up through to Vermont. You could do that because we had Quakers all the way up through New York State. You could pass them from one to another, friend to friend to friend. <clears throat> and that's all the Underground Railroad was, was passing along someone to someone you trusted and knew wouldn't turn you in, wouldn't rat you out, wouldn't go to the authorities and say, oh look, I got a, you know, can I get a founder's fee? I, I, I have a fugitive here. That's what it was. And how were they connected? It wasn't some big grand scheme. It wasn't like you know being part of um, AARP or being some some kind of big organization like you know um, you know the, the historical you know National Historical Society. Um, it was really just about your connections. You're connected through church. You're connected by family. You're connected by anti-slavery societies. There were there were like over 90 of them in New Hampshire. Vermont had probably. 85 or more of each town having their own little group that would get together and they would talk about how bad slavery was. But most of the time it was just, you know, it wasn't an active thing, you know. <laughs> but there, sometimes it was. Sometimes you had women <coughs> part of a, a woman's anti-slavery society and they would make clothing and they would supply, they would have that ready and that would be supplies for um, incoming runways. Um, so these were the ways you were connected. And the, that's how it worked. So let's 
look at New Hampshire. Okay, let's look at let's just bring it into New Hampshire so we can look at people who actually did this here. In all of these towns that I researched, there were people who were helping runaway slaves, or there were blacks living in these um, places. Now, the only one that's on record in New Hampshire as an Underground Railroad safe house is the Moses Cartland House in Lee, New Hampshire. Down there, Lee. And this is Moses Cartland. And his house is the only one that has been documented and is known by most that Moses Cartland um, had runaways. He, had, he ran a school. He was a Quaker. He ran a school. He was very good friends with um, William Lloyd Garrison, who was the father of the abolitionist movement. Um, he was also cousins with John, Lee, uh, John Greenlee Whittier, the nation's poet at the time. That's the only one. But I beg to differ because in researching letters and journals and town histories and local tradition, the, all of these towns, okay, and I cover them in the book. We can't go through every night, uh, every one of them, even though Lee said, I could have you here till midnight. Um, but let's just look at a few stories, okay? Um, very quickly, um, you can look this up. I have it in the, in the book. But one of the very earliest um, incidences of um, a runaway that we know of in New Hampshire was Ona Judge Staines. Has anybody heard of Ona Judge? Um, the book just came out. Please get it. There's a, a woman who just wrote a book about Ona Judge. She was part of George and Martha Washington's presidential staff. She was a child who was, she was a, a slave who was born in, at Mount Vernon. And she ended up at a very young age being very talented. And she became the playmate of Martha's grandchildren and also a seamstress at a very young age. So she would move with the presidential staff they would move from Mount Vernon to Philadelphia because in the 1700s, George was presiding over our country in Philadelphia. And at the presidential house, she, she would live. There'd be a whole staff of slaves. And they would rotate them every six months. So she would live in Philly, Philly for um, you know six months, and then she'd go back to Mount Vernon. And then she'd switch back to Philadelphia. And in the time that she was there, she was as she got older, or she was like 18 or so, she started to meet some of the free blacks that were in Philadelphia and started to hear about what life could be like. And so basically, in a nutshell, she has friends who get, she, she um, takes off one night from the presidential house, and she get, has friends that stow her away on a ship, and that ship takes her out of Philadelphia, and she lands in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She starts a free life. In and she stayed her whole life here. She married, she had children. George and Martha were not impressed. And uh, George sent dispatches to the custom agents in Portsmouth, a number of them, and requested that they find her and bring her back. And these letters, you go online, you can read them. Um, they try to, they try to get her to come, you know, they try to get her to come back. They, they actually talked to her. She didn't keep stay in hiding the whole time. But George Washington and Martha could not believe that that, that Ona had won the capacity to under, to desire freedom and understand what life free would be. <sighs> Please, and then they assumed she was seduced or kidnapped and taken away from them. That's what they thought. Her story is incredible. Truly incredible. In the late 1800s, after George Washington and Martha died, and, and you know she never was captured, she never went back. Even in the 18, late 1800s, a newspaper um, reporter did an article on Ona, and they and it's a wonderful article, and asked her, and she was very blunt. I would rather live poor and destitute, free, than ever have returned to slavery and Washington's home. So that's an amazing story. So get that book. It's, I think it's called Ona Judge. I, 
look it up. But I know it just barely came out, and she just the author just did a um, a presentation in Portsmouth um, at the T um, at the Discover Portsmouth. Um, another one. This one I have to read to you. So. Just so there is, there is documented proof. These aren't just stories. These aren't just uh, tales of escape or tales of pursuit. Um, there, are, there are documents out there that prove that yes, runaways were coming through New Hampshire. And this is one of those documents. It's um, at uh, Broader in their special collections. And there was a, a Dartmouth student, uh, Lemuel Spofford, in 1839, wrote a letter to his friend who was off campus for the term. And he, Lemuel was like, you're missing out, bud. I mean, the, all this great stuff is happening here at Dartmouth College, and you're not here. So he writes this letter, and in it, out of all the thing, of, uh, things that he talks about, he says, there was a pitiful object passed through this place a fortnight since. A poor runaway slave who had thrown off his shackles of slavery and was making his way through a land of freedom to a land of freedom at the request of good abolitionists. Now this would be in Hanover. And Lemuel is in Hanover at Dartmouth, okay? So this runaway has come, has come to Hanover. At the request of the good abolitionist, he went into the chapel on campus and told his tale, his pitiful tale, in the presence of 400 or about. 400 people were in the chapel on Dartmouth campus listening to this man talk. Well, that's proof positive. Um, it, Lemuel went on to, to tell his friend, he carried the marks of slavery, which were arguments that could not be denied. One was a very crooked leg, which had um, been broken by his mistress while she was in a rage at him. His master, he said, was good. He never whipped him but once, and he said it was with 110 lashes because the slave forgot to tie up the horses. Well, did you repeat that last? I said, um, he said that he had been whipped but once, he said, with 110 lashes because he forgot to tie the horses. This is what 400 people sat and listened to. And here was a person right in front of them, the victim of, the sl of slavery. That's amazing. This is documented proof. This is awesome. This is really great that that, that exists. <clears throat> there are other stories. And I have a lot of, I want to introduce you to some people. A lot of people. <laughs> okay. Now, the one thing about the one of my pet peeves about this subject is that everybody wants to talk to you about houses. They want to talk about um, secret hideaways and tunnels and hidden rooms and trap doors. That's great. I love stuff like that. The problem is the house didn't help people. It's the people who opened the door in the house to help a stranger, and that's who I need to know. It's wonderful to find out about a tunnel, and I'll crawl through a tunnel if you show me one, okay? I mean, I have pictures of tunnels and, I, you know, secret rooms, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, that's exciting, but the reality is, these are people you need to meet. You need to know about John Coe and Senator Harper. You need to know that Moses Cheney um, was helping runaway slaves that Edmund Carlton in Littleton helped hundreds through Littleton. And he had um, a cellar, he had a hideaway in his cellar and a tunnel that went out to the bank near the river and it had a trap door. And that trap door, <laughs> you, didn't, you can't always see it because the, there was a dam there. And when they lowered the water, he could use the trap door. <laughs> he could, otherwise, he couldn't. Um, you had James Wilson in Prigaborough, you had Luther Melendi in Amherst, um, then Daniel Peabody Rogers, great man, very well revered with abolitionists. He was born and raised in Plymouth, moved to Concord, and he ran the Herald of Freedom newspaper. It was an abolitionist newspaper, and he printed anything he wanted, no matter if it was politically correct or not. He was huge in abolitionist circles. And, when, and he died young, and he was Frederick Douglass, 
thought the world of this guy. Um, John Greenleaf Whittier, you know, these are people that looked at, the, that looked at him because of how courageous he was for being brave. These are people who helped. Nathaniel White in Concord. Um, Nathaniel and his wife Armenia, well, they're responsible for the, the White Farm, the White Park. Armenia named it after Nathaniel. These are all people, and yes, women helped. I just don't always have all the pictures. Um, I do have Moses Cheney's wife, Abigail, over there. I have um, a minister's wife, um, Reverend Tenney's wife. These are people that really helped. But let's even zoom in closer so that you can get a, an idea of how they helped. First of all, in New England, um, especially in New, New Hampshire and Vermont, you found when they referred to helping runaways, you were usually conveying them. You were usually taking them from your house to someone else's house. That you didn't normally hear of, um, I'm gonna give you directions on a piece of paper and you're gonna look for this barn and that tree and, and look for, you know, you know, look for the, the you know, this little town. Normally you had runaways being taken by wagon, carriage. They were taken from place to place, for the most part. Um, and any means that you could. And for the most part, they were tra they traveled at night, and um, they usually were hidden, but not always. It really just depended on the circumstances. But here, this is a story that I want to tell you. Um, I want you to meet um, Moses Sawyer, who was a really good friend of Frederick Douglass. And everybody knows Frederick Douglass. Um, Frederick Douglass, he, one of the first speeches he ever gave as a free person, um, actually he was a fugitive slave, but as it, when he was free, was in New Hampshire. Did you know that? I mean, we think of Massachusetts where he, had, he, he ended up um, when he ran away first, and then he goes to Rochester, New York. No, in New Hampshire is where he got his feet wet talking like this, okay? Um, Pitts, I think it's Pittsburgh. I think there's a, um, a historic marker. Um, that uh, marks that he was in the town, that Frederick Douglass came to this town and he was asked, he was doing a lecture and nobody would invite him for the, the noonday meal because he was black. Finally somebody did. But there's a, there's a marker, you can, you can look that up. But Frederick Douglass was really good friends with Moses Sawyer. And he, when he was in New Hampshire, he would stay at this house, in Mo Moses' house in Weir. And he started his first autobiography, actually, at Moses' house. But I just love Moses. I love this guy. I like the way he, you know, his face. He looks like a friendly guy, where most of them look very angry. <laughs> okay? Now, Moses' daughter, Ellen Smith, wrote an, uh, about three letters to a researcher in the 19, early 1900s. The researcher was Wilbur Siebert, and he was an Ohio professor who was researching the road, the Underground Railroad, all around the country. And he canvassed the whole country and asking for information. And so he found out that Ellen Smith had information. She wrote him a couple letters, and in those letters she talked about her dad. And she talked about the fact that, yes, he helped runaways. Yeah, we'd have them as guests in our house. Um, Dad had a, a room, a closed off room in the cellar, in that cellar, where they would stay. He says, it, and she said, growing up, it was no big deal for, you know, to have um, runaways at the table for breakfast. And then she uh, talked about, she said, I don't really know all the details about how, you know, how Dad was connected or all I know is certain things. And one of the stories she said and talks about is how he trained, how he moved runaways on to the next place. <laughs> Moses Sawyer was really good friends with the president of the Concord Montreal Railroad in Concord, New Hampshire. And he had an arrangement with that person. I think I know who it is. I, th I think I do. But she didn't give the name. A lot of times names, people wouldn't give up names because they were afraid to. Um, so Moses' friend, they had a, he would send a message when he knew runaways were going to be coming to Moses' house. He would send on a message to his friend with the railroad. And at a designated time at night, 
Moses would load up the runaway, maybe one or two or three, in a wagon, and he would take off with them. And he would meet his friend at the railroad tracks about 14 miles away, close to Concord. And it was at a designated point where the railroad tra train would stop. The cars would stop, and it was a freight train. And so Moses and his friend, the railroad guy, what they would do is they would get <coughs> one of the freight cars that was loaded with wheat. Now, back then, they would have the cars loaded up with the loose wheat, and when it was full, they would seal the door so that this isn't going to open until it gets to Montreal, its destination. This car is not to be opened until you get to the end. And that's, that was a common thing on this railroad. But if you're Moses Sawyer and your buddies with the press of the railroad, um, you're going to go to that freight car that's sealed and open the seal up and slide the door open a little ways and say, okay guys, I need you to climb on top. So they would make the, the runaways climb on top of the wheat and lay up there, it can't be much room, <laughs> and lay on top and they close up the door, seal it, and they knew for a fact that that freight car would not be open until they were in the promised land, Canada. Real freedom. Now, that sounds really cool, but this was not a passenger car. This is wheat that's loose, and you're laying on top of it, so, you know, if you have allergies, I mean, if you're, you know, all I, you know, I can just think of suffocating is all I can think of. But we're talking about this is how they would get some of the runaways safe across the border. What a cool story. I didn't make it up. Ellen Smith knew her dad had told her that. Okay? So that's cool. That's a really neat story and, I, and a unique story. Okay? Let's talk about another one. Oh, yeah. Sometimes we don't know how many times someone helped to run away. It could have been just once. Moses Sawyer helped hundreds. Okay? He, he was on a regular network. He was friends with all, the, all of them. And um, he was a Quaker, so all the Quakers in you know the eastern side of New Hampshire all were moving runaways um, and other you know other people. Sometimes that letter is how you find out. Sometimes it's somebody wrote it in their journal, and I'm sure that you have heard about this. But my friend in Steve Ristelli in Broughton, Vermont, was in an antique bookstore in Boscoen, New Hampshire, back in the 1990s. And he was, he's just interested in antiquities and anything. And he picks up this journal that he finds on a shelf and, you know, looks at it. I don't know what this is. And there's no name. There's no um, address on it. And he just, it's 1862. He starts looking through it and leafing through it. And he just happens to, you know, okay, it looks like a farmer's journal. I mean, it, it sounds like, it sounds like they're a hay producer. It sounds like they're, they have an apiary, they have beekeeping supplies, this kind of stuff. It's different things that the family's doing. June 1st, 1862, he reads this. This is after Father, Mother, Margaret, and Rebecca go to church, go to meeting. And then it rained a little that day. The last line stops Ristelli's heart. A fugitive slave. Come here about 10 o'clock this evening to stay all night. I fixed him a bed in the wool room. That was the journal writers helping a stranger, helping a runaway slave. He put a question mark afterward because sometimes you were not sure. You were not sure if this person did not come, it was not delivered to him, it was not conveyed to him. This person showed up at his door, you know, oh, I was going to knock on that, it's plastic. This person showed up at his door about 10 o'clock at night, and this person let him in, and we don't know any more than that. I don't know if he took him the next night somewhere, I don't know, the next entry doesn't say anything, doesn't have anything helpful, like, well, I uh, took him to Moses Sawyer's house, and then I know Moses is going to put him on that train car. No, none of that. 
Because the whole thing about the Underground Railroad and people who were agents who helped runaways is that this was their role in this. All they knew was this. All I know, and all the letters that I've read, because you can access Wilbur Siebert's um, collection online, and you can read the letters yourself, and 90% of the time, people who were helping runaways, that's what they'd say. I only know a little bit. I don't know if it's much help. This is what I did. No, no CNN um, interview, no claim to fame, no 15 minutes um, where you're going to interview them and do a book and then they're going to do a movie. No. So that person wrote that. And so my friend Steve Ristelli enlisted the help of the late Richard Henderson, who was an Enfield, New Hampshire historian, and put Henderson onto the mystery. And he's the one that uncovered it. He uncovered it that now down near the Plainfield line on the Meriden Road. So we're real close here. You guys know where that is. You probably have driven on that road. Well, I haven't, but you probably have, right? And down here is an E and J Wood house. There's Braden Hill Road, there's Durkee Road, this is Route 120. He figured out that James Wood had kept this journal. That James Wood had written that line in 1862, and he learned all about James Wood. Now, there are two James Woods, as I had said to um, Lee. There are two James Woods that lived in, in Lebanon. Now, this one was Ephraim and Mary Woods' son, and he was a hay, produ he was a hay producer, <laughs> and um, a beekeeper and very pro prosperous farmer, okay? And had, I think, about 1,800 acres. And he lived down here. That entry was written by him. And we know, after Henderson did some research, that descendants of James Wood have other journals of his. Um, there's a Daniel Wood that, um, 10, 15 years ago, got a whole box of these journals from Bosco in New Hampshire, and because that's where his wife was from, Rebecca. And because he kept a journal every year, okay? He was a, he was a, that's wonderful. The only thing is, there's only one that has this entry. One. And that's the kind of stuff you find. So for, from 1862 until the 1990s, this journal sat in a box and then sat in a bookstore and nobody knew. And I don't know, maybe it was just that once. This is more information about him. I have given that to Lee um, about the fact that, um, you know, he had three children and um, donated land for the town farm. And this is all right here. This is in Lebanon, in Lebanon near the Plainfield line. So that's what this is. This, um, I did a, a, a board on it because, I'm sorry, I'm still very visual and I'm not totally computerized, so you have to put up with this stuff. <laughs> so, but I did a board so you can see the entry yourself. And you can see that this journal was auctioned off by the Swan Auction House in New York for uh, $1,500 that um, last year it made the New York Times. That's so cool. It gets even better. Um, last year, the, the uh, Eve Kahn, who does a, an antiquities, um, she does a column in the New York Times every week. She did something on um, clues to the lives of runaway slaves, and in it she interviewed me, and she mentions that, well, let me read it for you. She mentions me. Okay. <laughs> and she mentions my, she does a plug for my New Hampshire book. Booyah. And then um, it says, in 1862, a runaway slave arrived on a rainy spring night at James Woods Farm in Lebanon, New Hampshire. And there's the quote. I fixed him a bed in the pool room, Mr. Wood noted in his diary. So that made the New York Times, James Wood made the New York Times. And even better, the search continues, yes, yes, I will come down and I will look through every box you have. So tonight, this is what happens. I can research something in the 90s and then 10 years later something else crops up. 
So tonight I find out that when Lee Hammond said, well, I think we have that journal in the Lebanon Historical Society, I went, no, you don't. <laughs> I said, you don't have the journal because I know Steve sold it at auction and no historical society is going to pay $1,500 for a journal unless you're really loaded in the historical, I mean, not, so. All right, see, so I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing because I know small town. But tonight I find out that they know, say your name again? Fran. Fran knows that um, uh, Mr. Welch, who was local, bought it, this journal at that Swan auction that yes, in fact, he donated it to the Lebanon Historical Society, so let's go look for it. Wow. She says it's in a box. I go, oh, no, 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 no. You mean a photocopy of the pages? And she goes, no. The journal. <laughs> and I'm going, what? I'm sorry. This is news to me. And I'm a little dramatic. Okay? I didn't jump up and down, but I sure wanted to. So we have to go find that. Because some, that journal has made it back to Lebanon. How cool is that? Okay, sorry. I got, see, I got all excited. Now, the Pillsbury that he married, was she related to the Pillsbury? I have to look that up. Someone else pointed that out. Yeah. Never dawned on me. No, it, it are. I'm going to have to check because Rebecca Pillsbury, her family was from Boscoin. That's close to Henniker, isn't it? Isn't, isn't it? Well, I know it's Pillsbury State Park, so Pillsbury was somebody. I'm going to look that up, okay, because that is something that someone brought up. Um, actually, yeah, I was in Hampton Sunday, and someone brought that up, okay? So that is a good point, and I'll find that out and I'll let Lee. So that's history surfacing. Let's find out some more, shall we? Okay? How are we doing? Oh boy, are we all right? Okay, it's eight o'clock. Can I keep going? All right. All right. So that's the kind of stuff that you come across. That's written, documented. That's documented. Okay. Now I know for a fact that in Canaan, New Hampshire, um, there were uh, James, James, George, John, and Dr. Timothy Tilton. <laughs> We're all helping runaway slaves. I do not have time to go into the incredible story of Noise Academy, but in this in this small town in New Hampshire in 18, um, 1835, the abolitionists got together and created a biracial school called Noise Academy on Canaan Street. It only lasted a few months because Sorry, but there was Enfield and Lebanon and um, area people did not want the black <coughs> students there. These were free students. And they literally got rid of the school by pulling it off of its foundation and dragging it down the middle of Cayman Street. It's an incredible story. It's in both my books. I had to fight for it to get in the Vermont book. Like I said, it's an incredible story of intolerance and prejudice. So I got it in both books. But in Canaan, you had these men helping. They also were all part of this school. You gotta look that one up. I don't have time to tell you that story. But I do know that from Canaan, because of the connections with that school, that Nathaniel Peabody Rogers was sending runaways to his buddies, James, George, Timothy, and John. Sending them once a month, 1830s, 1840s. And I know which houses. I have a couple pictures here, okay? And then from there, they would, um, they would put them, hide them in a wagon and take them to line. Calvin, Erdix, Arenas, and Samuel Balch. So this is really cool. Because this little network was formed in this little town of Lyme. And it's right in the town. It's not farm land, it's not off on, you know, near the river. This is right in the center of line. And you had the minister of the parsonage passing runaway slaves to his neighbor, Calvin, and to the Hamiltons, and then they would either take this road, East Bedford Road, and they would take them by wagon at night across to a network in Thetford. And I have that network in my Vermont book. Tiny little network in one town. Why would you do that? What's that all about? Was this, you know, some big, you know, some kind of cool neighbor initiation thing? No. In line, 
that congregational church right there. The congregation almost split in the 1830s because half the town was like, we're for slavery, so we don't want to hear anything bad about it. And the other half was like, abolitionists, get rid of it. And it almost divided the church. And that would have been a sad thing in this small town. And Reverend Tenney is the one who kept the church together. But the problem was that he was moonlighting as an underground railroad agent. He was helping runaways at this same time. So this is, this is known because there's a letter that, um, that Carolyn Fairfield wrote about her husband, Payson, because what they, these men chose to do was, if they were getting runaways coming from Canaan once a month, they had to have a system. And they live right in the middle of town. And you know, Mrs. L.J. Perry and T. Pressy are very nosy people. And if they found out that the minister in town was hiding and then transporting illegal aliens, immigrants, runaways, guess what? <laughs> All hell's going to break loose. So what they did was they enlisted their sons. And in this letter that was written in 1935, it tells me the rundown, that the boys, that the minister's son, Alan, would um, get a message from his dad to take to Mr. Fairfield. We have, we have packages coming tonight, be on the ready. Now the minister isn't going to, to uh, you know, have runaways come in a wagon hidden and then take them out, have them get out, and then run them through the bushes down the street. No. Alan's going to do that. And then when Alan gets to Fair, the Fairfield house, um, Payson Fairfield's going to jump, like, going to help. So they had their boys as runners. And the boys thought this was great. And they caught, you know, this, they were running them. They were running them from place to place. And then when they got to Hamilton's, they would, they're the ones that would load them in a wagon, cover them up with hay, and take them across the border into Vermont. This was a real network, right in the town, right in the houses, right on Route 10. And uh, well, OK, the parsonage has been rebuilt. It's not brick anymore. But this house still exists. This house, oh, there's Payson. This is the minister. This is, OK, Payson wasn't always old. He was a boy when he was a runner. But the letter talks about it's from his memory of being a runner. And that's just an awesome thing. A small network in a town. And you have to remember distances, too. So in Thetford, we had like four people that were involved in the same kind of network. Sometimes you had that, instead of just one person helping in a town. But that's something that we wouldn't know about unless Payson's wife wrote that down. I heard it over and over again, all the exciting tales. And sometimes they wouldn't make it. Sometimes the runaways would get caught. Sometimes they'd make it to Canada. You can read the letter yourself. We're almost done. This is really cool. This, this is what happens. History is constantly being revealed as the journal is evidence. Now, I have been researching this for over 25 years. And when I first was doing a newspaper series, I actually was doing it on Northeast Kingdom, Vermont, and um, like uh, Haverhill, Lisbon, and Littleton. And I started researching Edmund Carleton, all the way far right. Yeah, far right. And I researched him. And local tradition had him helping hundreds of, of runaways in Littleton. He and his wife were very active. And I learned a lot about them. And so I've known Edmund for a long time. And he's my Edmund. Now, that's not documented. And I believe that local tradition is just as important as documented. Because this is a story that's passed down from the 1800s. And Edmund died in the late 1800s. So somebody knew him that wrote it down that this was a story. So I'm working on the New Hampshire book and re, you know, touching base with uh, about um, things that I had touched base 20 years ago. And I'm reading letters, and I'm reading a letter that William Lloyd Garrison, who was the father of the abolitionist movement, he writes this letter. And I'm reading it on the collection, and I just freak out because <laughs> in the letter he mentions my Edmund. He mentions him directly. And like Edmund Carlton of Littleton, same guy. 
Okay, same guy. No mistaking on that. Not that James Wood thing, okay, where there's two in one town. No, there's only one Edmund in, in, in Littleton. I know that. Um, okay, so this is really something else. So all of a sudden, I read that Garrison is mentioning Carlton, Edmund Carlton, and he's writing this letter to Nathaniel Rogers. Remember him? Nathaniel Rogers. He's writing the letter to him. The letter's written in 1842, and it spells out a runaway slave moving up through New Hampshire. This is like a dream for a researcher to have this all spelled out. So William Lloyd Garrison, I gotta tell you the story. So William Lloyd Garrison is writing this letter after the fact. He's writing Nathaniel Rogers because someone is standing in front of him telling him a story. And he is looking for fact, you know, to, cor to corroborate this. So William says that one evening, he's in, he's in Massachusetts, okay, all right, I think it's Newburyport. The, he, the, he's having a meeting of abolitionists, they're having like an anti-slavery uh, meeting and there's a whole bunch of them, they're all getting together to say, what are, you know, where are we going to put, you know, have a, you know, where are we going to have some kind of uh, protest tomorrow? And there's a knock on the door. And the door opens and there's this runaway slave. And he says, I heard that there were a bunch of friends here that could help me and I want to get to Canada. Can you help me? Well, that just threw everybody into a flurry. And they go, oh boy, this is great. This is going to be a great meeting. Um, here's this guy. He needs help. Let's get into the action. So William Lloyd Garrison is, they set it all up. Okay, we need you, we need to have you taken from here to here and they have a plan. They write out letters of introduction so that Nathaniel Rogers, when he actually has um, this man brought to him, um, this letter says, William, your buddy William says he's a, good, he's a good guy and you need to pass him on and he's on his way to freedom. So they get this all set up. And I don't know exactly, unless you, I don't know exactly who got him first. All I know is that he worked his way from Newburyport, Massachusetts into New Hampshire and he get, makes it to Concord because Nathaniel Rogers sees him. In the letter it says that. Nathaniel Rogers helps him. So one night he's at Rogers. Rogers sends him to his hometown of Plymouth. And in Plymouth, Dennis and Burnham helps him. Oh, here's another name. Proof, proof positive written down, okay, documented. Dennis and Burnham owns the Pemichawasset Hotel, which was a huge resort at that time. No longer standing, but huge resort. Well, this runaway, I know, went to Denison's house. And from Denison's house in Plymouth, he gets taken up to Edmund's house, Edmund and Mary, and he gets to stay there in Littleton. We're almost to the Canadian border now. So we have Edmund and Mary, and they take, what they do is they actually pay off a carriage driver, and they put him in a carriage and say, here's some money, here's some stuff like a trunk of stuff, because you're going to go settle, and, you know. He's going to take you all the way to Canada, so you need stuff. So he's put in this carriage, and the carriage heads north. Now, north of Littleton is Lancaster. Now, they're not supposed to stop in Lancaster, but it's about there that the carriage does stop. All of a sudden, they run away sitting in the carriage, and they stop, and it's like, no. That Mr. Carlton said we were going straight through. The carriage stops, so I don't know if something's wrong. So the runaway opens up the door, and he opens up the door of the carriage, and standing right there, right in front of him, is his owner, his owner from the south that he ran away from. Now, I didn't make this up. I mean, this is not a theatrical thing. Well, I'm making it that way, but <laughs> okay. He's standing right there, and just as shocked as this poor kid is, so is that owner. Because that owner is not looking for him, and he's not, he's not chasing him. <laughs> no. <laughs> he vacations in the White Mountains, very calm, and lots of Southerners went to the Mount Washington Hotel, went to the Castle in the Clouds, all that stuff. They all vacationed up here. It was just really bad timing, really bad place, time, all that jazz, okay? So, here's the owner, as soon as he sees his property, he grabs him and throws him to the ground. This is in the letter. 
throws him to the ground, starts berating him and telling him, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to you know, take, drag you back home. I'm going to make an example of you. And he has some of his friends with him, the owner. And this kid is on the ground and is just like, uh, he's too close. He's too close. This is just not going to happen. And he jumps up and he bolts. I mean, literally just bolts. He just takes off for the woods. And the owner and his friends is like, go after him. They try to chase him, but it's, you know, it's in Langston. Have you ever been up there, Jefferson? Okay, it's all woods and moose. I mean, there's not much up there. I was just up there, and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Lots of trees. These guys, get, okay, these guys give up. That kid takes off. Now, like I said, it was just bad timing. That kid works his way from Lancaster all the way back to southern New Hampshire, and he makes his way back to William Lloyd Garrison's door. He makes it all the way back to Newburyport, and he's, he's standing there and he says, this is what happened, and I didn't get to Canada, and this is really, this is my story. So in the letter, William Lloyd Garrison says, he's standing right in front of me, and this is what he's telling me, and I really believe him. I don't think this is a scam. I don't think he went to Boston and blew all his money in the bars that we gave him. I really think that this kid made it to Lancaster and then got met his owner. So he says, I do believe this. So now he says, now we have to do this all over again, except he should be like in, like escorted, nobody would leave his side. William is writing Nathaniel to say, please check with Edmund. I know he saw him. I know, you know, I, I know that the letters of introduction, he has them on him. I know this. So this kid made it back, and I don't know after this. There's no following letter that says, you know, postcard from Montreal. You know, <laughs> I made it. No, I don't, there's none of that. This is amazing stuff. And it also proves my Edmund really did help the runaway. Not just, you know, not just an assumption or a local tradition. But this is fascinating stuff. And I guarantee that this kid <laughs> never touched a road, never knocked on a door. I'm sure he scared out of his wits all the way through New Hampshire until he got to one door he didn't know. Because how is he going to remember where all these places are? But this is a real story. It really happened. And it happened as far north as Lancaster. God's country, you know? So the thing is, I'll wrap up. We started at the beginning about how history and, the, and how history was rewritten in New Hampshire. Shame on them that they did that. It's very irresponsible. The, the reality is, is that history is history. It's, it's, it's ugly, it's good, it's terrible, um, you know. But it's history. And, and as a historian, it's your job to share it, all the details. I'm a newspaper person, been in the newspaper business for 30 years. And you report what happened. You don't editorialize on it. You don't choose the nice stuff and then, you know, you leave out all the ugly stuff. Well, that's what happened in New Hampshire. So now we're not doing that. Now we're uncovering it. You know, check out Portsmouth. I have flyer somewhere. Um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire has a great history. Um, show, you know, sharing this stuff. Because things have been uncovered. 21st century, you have the, the 1779 slave petition that was found in a filing cabinet in the New Hampshire State um, Historical Society. This thing was, in a, was no, not seen since 1779. 20, 20 slaves from Portsmouth wrote this asking for freedom because you Americans just got yours and we deserve the same. This is a beautiful document and thank goodness it wasn't thrown out. But this was uncovered in the 21st century. Um, the African burial ground, you know about that, right? You know about that in Portsmouth? Please go to the memorial. It is incredible. You had an, a black cemetery right in the middle of Portsmouth, and it was on the maps until the 1800s, and then they decided they need another street. So they made Chestnut Street over the cemetery. Well, I told you, history will resurface. And so in, what, 2003, they're doing a water sewer project, and they're digging down for the sewer, and what do they hit? 13 coffins. 
history will come to the surface. And so now it's a beautiful memorial. I definitely push it. I have it at the, in the back of my book, it's blatant advertising for Portsmouth, Black Heritage Trail, for the, the Milford Harriet Wilson. Um, I don't even go into Dartmouth and uh, Eliza Wheelock. I mean, all the Ivy schools, how their base was slave labor. Ebony and Ivy, check that book out. Um, Craig Stephen Wilder um, uncovered that. that and Dartmouth, he, yeah. He was buying and selling slaves. I actually held the, you know, the, the bill of sale for Ishmael that Eliza Wheelock bought, and he sold. And you can go and you can touch that. They have it at the um, special collections. These are documents. All this stuff will come to light. There's so much of it. There he is, okay? There's so much, and I don't have time to go into it. You have been so patient. Um, to sum it up, the historians in the 1800s wanted to make this nice, pretty, lily-white state. They wanted everything to be nice and wonderful. And the fact of the matter is, is that no matter where you are in our country, we're all we're all from somewhere else. Okay, we're all we're, our country, our states, our towns are all made up of all different kinds of people. And just like here in your Granite State. The history of black heritage and slavery and um, underground railroad all existed. And it, so I like to say that, you know, New Hampshire is finding out in this 21st century that your state is just like Granite, made up of all kinds of people. And the, the secrets will be uncovered. My job is not to just read about this, these great people and these great stories, it's to share them which is why I was driven to write the books, which is why I do talks, because these are amazing people who risk things. And you know what? I don't know if we are that brave and courageous today. Because would you be like James Wood on Meriden Road, and if someone knocked on your door, would you fix a room in the wool, would you fix a bed in the wool room for somebody, a stranger, somebody you've never seen? Would you? I don't know if I would. It really makes me think that all of these people are her heroes and heroines and um, how they need to be honored. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do and teaching it to you, to, to New Hampshire and Vermont school kids, trying to share the story. So thank you so much for being so patient and listening to some of my stories. And I do have the books. Please check out the displays because I just like to have a picture. And, <laughs> and there are postcards, so you can take those, you know, you can check books out. The stories are incredible, and the people you need to get to know. So thank you for asking me. And when I promised, the local uh, rest stop, this is the house. And if you go down, the Meriden Road starts out of School Street and keeps going four and a half miles. You see a big lumber yard on the right hand side as you're heading down. Right across the street from the lumber yard, you see this big white house which now has a number of apartments in it. I don't have any idea where the wall room is, but if you're going down that way, you might want to look over and see the And we're going to find that journal, aren't we? Yeah. Find that journal, right? Yes. Okay. Come on, I'm, I'm going to just keep bugging you. Okay. <laughs> We've got a lot of searching to do, so join the Historical Society and help us search through the